Well, good morning from St. Bart's in Midtown Manhattan. My name is Peter Thompson. I serve as the vicar here. And whether you're joining us online or here in person on Park Avenue, it is my joy and delight to welcome you to the forum where each week we host sacred conversations about the things that matter. And today we'll be talking about the Bible and specifically about what the Bible says about key ethical issues that are debated in our time and place. And we are very honored to be joined by Professor John Collins, Professor Emeritus at Yale University, where he happened to be one of my professors. Um, and uh, he is the author of the book, What Are Biblical Values?, which is available in our bookstore and you can uh, purchase on your way out today. He's also the author of uh, a very well-known and well-used Hebrew Bible textbook, um, which we also used in the class that he taught. Um, and that may be in our bookstore as well. Um, serving as moderator this morning, and it, to my left is Liza Page Nelson. Liza is a former warden of the parish, and she uh, also is the mentor for the Education for Ministry group that takes that uh, is uh, meets here at St. Bart's. Um, Education for Ministry is an intensive four-year program, uh, formational program for lay people that is um, hosted under the auspices of the University of the South at, in Sewanee, Tennessee. Uh, Professor Collins is an EFM author, so it makes um, a special sense for Liza to be moderating today. And I'll hand it over to you. Great. Okay, well, good morning. I'm so happy to see so many EFM people, Education for Ministry people and alums. Thank you for showing up. Um, welcome to both Drs. Collins, uh, in addition to John Collins, our guest, who will be speaking. We have uh, Dr. Adela Yarbrough Collins, his wife, a renowned New Testament scholar. So we've got the whole Bible represented, but she's not on duty today. Let me tell you a little bit about John Collins. He is a renowned scholar, prolific author, anchor Bible series general editor, and has published extensively on the Hebrew Bible, which Christians commonly call the Old Testament, and also on apocalypticism, wisdom, Hellenic Judaism, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. He was a longtime professor at Yale Divinity School, as Peter mentioned, and before that at the University of Chicago and Notre Dame. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees at University College Dublin, his PhD at Harvard, and for his many contributions to the field, Dr. Collins was awarded honorary doctorates at the University, University College and the University of Zurich. The British Academy for Biblical Studies awarded him the Burkitt Medal, and he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And yet, was gracious enough when our EFM group had some questions that could only be answered by going to the source, he responded to my email, and here we are. And the springboard for, day, for today is what, is what are biblical values. I will stop, ask if there's anything you want to add, but also invite you to share, if you would, some of your story and your formation. What drew you to the Bible in the first place and what kept drawing you deeper and broader? Well, I grew up in a small place in rural Ireland before Vatican II. Uh, most people in the area were Catholic. I knew a few Protestants. Uh, the definition of a queer in those days was somebody who didn't go to Mass. Uh, now, we did not read the Bible. In fact, every now and then, we were warned against it. You know, we knew the parables because you'd get those from the preaching and church. At the Old Testament, we hardly knew at all. Now, a turning point, an early turning point in my life is when I got a scholarship to a boarding school, which was run by the Holy Ghost Fathers, or Spiritans, uh, they were mostly a missionary order, but they also had some schools in Ireland, and they run Duquesne University in this country. Mm. No, but they were mostly missionaries in Africa. Now, when I arrived there, a group of us, uh, maybe a dozen of us, were called out of the study one evening and told, you're going to do Greek. In those days, everybody did Latin. You had to have Latin to matriculate, to, to go to the university. 
So <clears throat> two of us actually liked the Greek and stuck with it for five years. Now, in the, on the other side of the Atlantic, education is much more on a track system. And once you get on a track, it gets more difficult to get off it. So at the, you know, being impressionable and dutiful at the time, when I finished in the high school, I joined the religious order. And when I went along to the seminary, uh, they said, now, what would you like to do with the university? And I said, classics. And they said, well, all right, you can do classics if you'll also do Hebrew, and then you can teach scripture. That's how I got to be a scripture scholar, basically. <laughs> As it turned out, when I went, to, went along then to classes in the university, the Hebrew professor was much more engaging than the classics professors. He was a priest uh, who later became Archbishop of Dublin, a man named Dermot Ryan, uh, but he, he was a very good Hebrew teacher. And it was he persuaded the religious order to let me go on to do my PhD and to apply for a scholarship to Harvard, which I did. Uh, this was in the years after Vatican II. There were a lot of things changing in the Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of Catholic religious at Harvard in my time who began as Catholic religious and ended as something else. And I was one of those. Now, I had met Adela along the way. Uh, so I informed Dermot, my teacher in Dublin, and he wasn't uh, put out about this at all. He said, well, actually, that solves a lot of problems. I need an assistant anyway. You can come back and teach. You know, if I had gone back to the religious order, I'd have to go off to study theology, and God knows, might be sent to Africa or something. So he was quite happy. And then he was appointed Archbishop of Dublin. So for one year, I was the Department of Semitic Languages at University <laughs> College Dublin. That department no longer exists at a certain point that decided that you really needed to have more than two or three people <laughs> in a subject. But uh, in the course of that year, then we decided to get married. <clears throat> and so I had to look back to this side of the Atlantic. Adela came to Dublin. There really wasn't a second paying position for anyone to teach scripture in Ireland at that time. All the teaching in the Catholic schools was done by nuns and priests who worked for nothing, basically. And uh, teaching at a place like Trinity College which was, was not uh, an option for a Catholic, I would say, at that time. So she got a job at a Presbyterian seminary in Chicago, and I fortunately got, was picked up by the Catholic seminary in Chicago, and I taught there for five years. Uh, in Mandalay, Illinois, and then I moved to DePaul University in Chicago, and then in the mid-80s we were both invited to Notre Dame, and some six years after that to the University of Chicago, and then in 2000 we moved to Yale. So pretty much all my teaching, uh, except for the, the very first year in Dublin, was in some kind of religious context, either a Catholic religious college or a divinity school uh, later on. And actually, in the uh, university in Dublin, all my students were either nuns or priests, uh, and the only people doing Hebrew were people who were going to go on to do scripture. Now, uh, now having said all that, my training at Harvard wasn't at all theological. Uh, very little theology in it at any rate. The major emphasis was learn the languages, learn the historical context, know the material. Actually, the philosophy at Harvard in my time was you learn all the stuff around the Bible. And they figure you learn, figure out the Bible later on. And I think actually it was a good approach because it's the other stuff you need to learn you know, that will then inform your reading of it. But once I started teaching, of course, especially in a seminary, uh, you know, I had done my degree in Old Testament Hebrew Bible, so my first year in the seminary, they taught me to teach New Testament. And this is very good, actually. You learn a lot on the job training uh, like that. 
And a lot of my early career, I worked in apocalyptic literature, which I still find fascinating, and I must say, uh, highly relevant, culturally speaking. <laughs> uh, maybe I wish it were not quite so culturally re relevant. But, uh, you know, as I went on in my career, I worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls for many years. Still do. Uh, but then in my later years at jail especially, it really struck me that people needed what I would call applied Bible. That for most people who do uh, go to divinity school, but to, to get a Master of Divinity degree, they need to know how this relates to contemporary issues. Now, I am not and never was a Bible Christian. You know, I didn't, not in the sense that a Baptist might be. Uh, I expect that most of you probably weren't either if, if in the, the Episcopalian tradition. Uh, but uh, so you know, for, for me, the Bible is the foundation of the tradition. It's not the last word, it's the first word. And it's the beginning you know, of a centuries-long conversation that's still going on. And so I started about 2010, I think maybe when Peter was around, I forget, uh, that uh, teaching this course on biblical values. And uh, it was probably the most popular course I ever taught. And uh, so that's where we are. That's how we got here. Great. Thank you. <coughs> so you write a lot about the context, as you said, and and the different messages that one can find within the Bible. Is there such a thing as biblical values? What, what do you mean yeah. by that? And um, related to that, why is it important to know what the Bible actually says? Well, uh, I mean, if I may adapt your last question first, it's important to know what the Bible says because they say this is the foundation of the whole tradition. You know, if we didn't find something substantial that we agreed with in the Bible, there wouldn't really be any point to, to being a Christian, I think. And now, I, I think it follows from that it's important to know what it really says, because a lot of people who profess themselves to be Bible Christians don't know that. And a lot of people go around you know, claiming that the Bible says things that it doesn't say at all. And this has happened through history. <laughs> this was happening already before the rise of Christianity, because people like to claim authority. And so, you know, of necessity, teaching Bible is often damage control. You know, it, it, it's often a matter of, you know, I, another uh, metaphor I would use for it is refinishing furniture. You know, scraping off. The, the, the layers that accumulated on it, that got spilled over it at some point or other, uh, to try to get back, you know. Um, now, that, you might say, is a Protestant enterprise. <laughs> it, it, in a discussion uh, one time at the Society of Biblical Literature with a, a good friend of mine, James Kugel, great Jewish scholar, and uh, uh, he, he, you know, I was being a little bit critical of him, and he wanted to get back at me, and he said, you know, you're the most Protestant scholar I know. He knew I wouldn't like that. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, there's some truth to it, uh, in the sense that I do value the original truth, the original whatever it is. <laughs> now, but at, at the same time, I think where it would not be accurate, you know, at least the, the version of, uh, of Protestantism that we were taught in the Catholic Church was that Protestantism meant sola scriptura, by scripture alone. And scripture alone, to my mind, is totally impossible. You could not live by scripture alone, no matter how much you tried. It just can't be done for, for many reasons. Partly because it was written three, two to 3,000 years ago in a very different culture. Uh, you cannot expect it to be a perfect fit for what's going on nowadays. Our understanding of the world is completely different. And it's 
full of contradictory positions. You know, it is not a coherent, systematic document. It is something that grew, you know, like a great medieval cathedral over, over hundreds of years with additions here and additions there. And sometimes the additions are corrections of earlier things. Sometimes you get revisions of biblical laws. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus says quite boldly, you have heard it was said to them of old, and quotes something from the Old Testament and said, but I say it to you. So you can't live by it all. In other words, you've got to find uh, some kind of a fulcrum in it. You have to have some kind of criterion for what you value more than other. Now, at the same time, you know, they, they, there have been movements at various times, uh, including figures like Thomas Jefferson, you know, who wanted to purify the Bible, throw out the stuff that's outdated and hold the, the good stuff. And this doesn't work, really, I think, because uh, sometimes, you know, in the book of Ecclesiastes, or Kohelet, it says, there is a time to love and a time to hate, a time to kill and a time to cure. And something that may seem to us quite wrong and dated in one context might come in useful again sometime. And so I am not at all in favor of purging the Bible that way, but you've got to realize that you're not dealing with a fully consistent or coherent document. You have different positions, different emphases, and you have to have some kind of criterion to guide your way through it. So you, you write a lot about that in the book, What Are <coughs> Biblical <coughs> Values? And some of the examples of the contradictions that you point out. Um, one is the Exodus story, which is so oh, yeah. foundational to the Jewish and Christian's tradition and re you know, remember that you were slaves and remember that God kept God's promises to liberate you and make you yeah. God's people. And yet um, the historical criticism approach and the archeological control suggests maybe it didn't quite happen the way we read in the Bible. Um, and yet it's preserved. Yes. Talk about that a little bit, if you would. Well, you know, probably uh, the biggest shock that some students get when they study the Bible is when they find that some things that they thought, you know, were important historical events probably didn't happen. Uh, the walls of Jericho are probably the parade example. You know, everybody knows the story of the walls of Jericho coming tumbling down. Well, the present state of archaeology is that uh, Jericho wasn't inhabited at all at the appropriate time. And one theory on how that story originated is that there were indeed ruins there, and centuries later, people thought, well, this must be how it happened. And I think in many cases, stories that we would now regard as fictions were actually attempts to figure out what, what must have happened. Now, you know, the Exodus is another one. Again, the archeological evidence isn't terribly supportive of it at this point in time. I should say, you know, archeological evidence changes over time because, you know, today's assured result may be overturned by tomorrow's excavation. So it's not uh, that we are trying to be dogmatic on the basis of archaeology, but at the same time, it's the best knowledge we have at the moment of it. So I think one of the things that you learn, in, if you did the introduction to Old Testament at jail, would be you've got to let go of a certain amount of your confidence in the historicity. You know, at the end of the day, what you're going to learn from the Bible, it's not cosmology. You know, no matter what games people play to try to make Genesis chapter 1 compatible with, with evolution, uh, they don't work. It's just a different way of looking at it, you know. So you don't learn cosmology. There's a lot of good history in the Bible, but there also there is a lot of material that's historically dubious. 
You know, it certainly wouldn't do as your history textbook on its own. You certainly need to read it over against other evidence. So in the end of the day, what you're going to get out of the Bible is a, you know, a philosophy of life. It's largely ethics. It's largely a way you should live. And even then, you're going to find that it's not a book of answers. It's much more a book of questions. That a, a lot of the examples it gives you will raise more questions than the answer. But that can be good. And also problematic. <laughs> so you, so many people, you know, so let, let's talk about <clears throat> violence a little bit. Uh, there are so yes. many divine <laughs> commands or things attributed to the deity to displace people, wipe them out, blot them from memory. It can't have been fun to be a Canaanite, an Amalekite, an Amorite, yeah. a Jebusite, some other ites. And yet, yeah. <clears throat> in the same testament, there's the prophetic witness um, of be, be kind to the, be good to the widow and the orphan. Again, the memory, remember you were a slave, have compassion for people who are yeah. slaves. Um, <clears throat> Micah, you know, walk, um, love justice, do mercy, walk humbly with God. That's all in the same testament. And in fact, mm -hmm. there are contradictory messages even within, say, Deuteronomy. De Deuteronomy is a, a good test case of that. Because on the one hand, you know, this is where you get the concern for the alien and for the poor. And, uh, but then also a command to wipe out the Canaanites. You know, which is something that was really only recognized as problematic, I'd say, in quite recent times. Uh, there's a book by an English scholar uh, named Whitlam in the 1990s, you know, that, that, uh, that really put that on the agenda. And it, it has been constantly on the agenda since. And of course, the whole situation in Israel uh, highlights the problematic nature of it too. This, I might say, is the real problem with the Exodus. You know, uh, you can live just fine with a good story that didn't happen. The fact that it didn't happen isn't at all fatal. You know, it can still be a great story and inspiring. The real problem with the Exodus is that when you take the slaves out of Egypt, what are you going to do with them? Where are they going to go? And of course, what they do is, in the biblical story, invade the land of Canaan. And this becomes, you know, maybe the most problematic story in the whole of the Old Testament, uh, when you look at it now. And again, I think it was Edward Said, a Palestinian, you know, who really highlighted that and said, if you read this from a Canaanite perspective, it isn't a liberating story at all. Because the Exodus, the liberation, would be no good if they didn't have somewhere to go. But, you know, life is problematic. There are no clear answers to things. This doesn't mean that the Exodus wasn't good. It certainly was a good thing. It was a great thing. But it means that, that it comes with another set of problems that then have to be addressed. In your book, you talk about how uh, people can take that story or elements from that story, elements from the conquest of Canaan, and use them rhetorically, analogically. Oh, yeah. And there have been, you can start with the Crusades, you can go to the pogroms. I mean, pick, talk a little yeah. bit about how people not really taking the Bible on its terms have used that to justify some bad behavior. Well, yes, no, you know, <laughs> but if you're going to use the Bible as scripture, then I think you have to find analogies between that situation and our situation. Otherwise, it just becomes irrelevant. Now, the problem is, if you pick certain analogies, it, it's not a pretty story. And this is, you know, it happened in this country. Uh, Cotton Mather, wrote about the Amalekites harassing us in the wilderness, meaning the Native Americans. Uh, it's the same story as used by the Puritans in Ireland, in South Africa, 
and of course uh, in Israel, and not just by, by Jews in Israel, but also by, by uh, Christian Zionists who are often even more zealous. Uh, now, is that a valid use of scripture? Well, it's certainly drawing an analogy, and you can see certain analogies there. But the problem is it conflicts with other basic things in the Bible. Uh, Nick Walterstorff, who also taught at jail, maybe before your time, I think, uh, Peter, in philosophy of religion, uh, said you know, that the real problem with violence in the Bible isn't just that it offends our sense of human decency. It also offends what we were taught was the basic message of the Bible. And you know, if you are taught, and it's not only Jesus in the New Testament, it's also in Leviticus, that you should love your neighbor as yourself, well, then you've got a problem with what they're told to do with the Canaanites. Now, I should say also, if you take the trouble to read through the whole Old Testament, you've got to notice they're very critical of their own religion. Uh, you know, back, uh, there was a controversy some years ago when a man named Jeremiah Wright, who had been a pastor to Barack Obama, said something not nice about America. And Walter Brueggemann, a biblical scholar, made the comment, did those people ever read the real Jeremiah? And uh, if you do, you find Jeremiah right, you know, was mild. <laughs> he wasn't. Uh, uh, most of the biblical prophets criticize Israel in a way that nobody would dare to do nowadays. That, too, I think, is a biblical value. It's a biblical value to question whatever it is. You know, even to argue with God is a biblical value in the Hebrew Bible. You get it with Abraham, you get it with Job. You know, you're not meant to just uh, take a set of answers and apply them. You're meant to argue about it and reason things out. Mm. Um. Saying, saying a bit more about that, going, let's, let's look at the New Testament for a minute, because um, you've been talking about one, I'll paraphrase badly, one needs to take the totality of the Old Testament to yeah. understand its messages. One can't pick and choose because you lose the overarching values and story. In the New Testament, there's some contradictions too, and you write oh, yeah. about how the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels is a very different Jesus than the Jesus we meet in the book of Revelation. Indeed. And yet there are, yeah. you know, there are many Christians who say, the Old Testament, that's not my God. I, I, yeah. I'm the God of the New Testament, and Jesus invented love and justice. So talk to us about that and why we can't be Marcionists. Well, you know. Remind us what those are. Mar oh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, Marcionists uh, were people who, uh, I don't know if their bones were burned twice for their heresy, uh, but they wanted to take parts of the Bible out, the problematic texts in the and Old Testament. Basically the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is nonsensical. That's what Jesus had to work with. That's what Paul had yeah. to work with. But. Um, Going, going back to you yeah. and all that. But now, uh, you know, when people try to discover or, or to figure out, you know, what in the Gospels really goes back to Jesus, one of the sometimes controversial criteria is the criterion of dissimilarity. That if you get something said in the Gospels that nobody else was saying, that that was probably Jesus. I think there is some force to that. I think, you know, if he, when you find the saying, love your enemy, there are plenty of texts in the Judaism and in the Old Testament already, love your neighbor. Uh, either love your neighbor as yourself or love your neighbor who is like you, as some people would translate it. But love your enemy, you know, th th this is pushing it. And I think there's a fair chance that that uh, does indeed go back to Jesus. Now, 
Uh, then uh, one that we've been working on actually lately in an article that Ella and I are doing is on the question of divorce, where in the Gospel of Mark, you know, what God has joined together, let no man put apart. Uh, and then the Gospel of Matthew comes along and says, except in the case of adultery. And I think that's a fairly clear case where somebody said he couldn't have meant that. You know, he must have surely. And you know, this would have been very typical in, in uh, Judaism at the time to say that, uh, you know, in the case of adultery, absolutely, yes, it, it's permissible. And so, you know, if Jesus said things that really went against what just about anybody was saying, well, then the, the tradition kind of pulled him back in line. Uh, it's a great novel by, by Dostoevsky, you know, where the Grand Inquisitor, and, and where <laughs> Jesus comes back and the Grand Inquisitor calls him in and says, you know, I know who you are. You caused enough trouble the first time round. It's taken us 2,000 years to correct <laughs> all the, the damage you did, so please go away. Uh, you know, that, that's again a, a loose paraphrase, but that, that's the gist of it. Well, I think church authorities have often worked like that with the, the message of Jesus in the Gospels, and I think actually, you know, the book of Revelation was doing that to some degree. One of the things I've worked on and written on is the idea of a messiah. And now there was a standard job description, I think, for a messiah in Judaism in the time of Jesus. What people wanted was somebody who would drive out the Romans and restore a kingdom of Israel. And, you know, Jesus didn't do that. Now, Fascinating question is why did people st some people still think he was the Messiah? But I don't think it's, a, it's difficult at all to see why some people didn't think he was the Messiah. You know, he didn't do what they were expecting him to do. And one of the ways the tradition dealt with that is, well, write another book and have him get it right. So Jesus didn't do what the Messiah was expected to do the first time, but he'll come back. And second time round, he'll be much more in accordance with what we were all expecting. <laughs> and that, that's actually what you get. I think even you get some of that already in the Gospels, at the end of the Gospels, that you get a very violent Jesus. And I think Jesus in the Gospels, whatever else you might say about him, was certainly non-violent, for the most part. <laughs> You know, except, except the money changers in the temple got to him. But, uh, but apart from that, uh, you know, he was nothing like the, the Christ of Revelation. So I have one more question about, about biblical values. And when you, when you think of the overarching themes, um, there are things that you have pointed out that make the Bible, both Testaments, unique in the literature and the teaching of the ancient Near East. And I guess I'm asking you this because um, I'd like us to end on an up note before the audience gets to ask <laughs> <Yes>. questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, I think the, the thing that I think has to strike you if you read through all of the Old Testament is the incessant demand for justice. Very good book by a Jewish uh, rabbi. I don't think he's even a professor named Jeremiah Overman. Who and, uh, and justice for all. And he claims, and I think he's quite right, there is no other body of literature from antiquity that attaches some, so much importance to justice. You get ideas of justice, certainly everywhere, but to have people you know, get so angry about it, so, so insistent on it, I think that is what's really striking in the Old Testament. Uh, it's not as strong in the New Testament because in the New Testament, everything is changed by the idea of resurrection and afterlife. And uh, in large part, I think it's a matter in the New Testament, it's more a perspective of life. And I think this maybe is one of the harder things said in the New Testament, you know, consider the lilies of the field. 
Well, it's all very well to consider them, but would any of us really like to live like that? <laughs> uh, but there is, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that there is a radical vision of how you should live, uh, which is compelling, you know, even if we don't always feel compelled to quite do it. And I think also that you're, you observe in, in this book and probably your other writings that another theme, part of justice is care for the poor oh, the, and, yeah. and uh, disparity in wealth. And that's, so yeah. justice, you know, justice has a very practical implication. There is, I would say, a common definition of justice in the ancient Near East. And that is that the powerful not oppress the weak. You get that already in the Code of Hammurabi. And Hammurabi may not have done much to implement it, but he was certainly going to profess it. He was going to claim to do it. And I mean, that, that's the bottom line in the New Testament. And it's, there's nothing in the New Testament that goes against that, really. Uh, but but uh, it's in the Old Testament, I think, that you really get it emphasized. Still kind of relevant. We have a, a few minutes for questions, and Suzanne Vorster has um, some question cards that she'll bring around. So if you raise your hand, if you're here in person, she'll bring them to you uh, and then collect them. If you're joining us online, you can uh, enter something into the live chat on YouTube or the comments function on Facebook, or you can email me, pthompson at stbarts.org, p-t-h-o-m-p-s-o-n at s-t-b-a-r-t-s dot org. You can do that if you're in the room, too. Well, we're waiting for those questions, Professor Collins. Um, we haven't yet talked about in, in the book you um, explore issues like abortion and homosexuality and yeah. uh, things that are often uh, referred to as biblical values, and you kind of correct the record. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you've also spent a lot of time around progressive Christians. Are there ways yes. in which progressive Christians also distort or overstate the biblical record? Well, I'm sure there are. Now, you know, I, I haven't been thinking about that, so I don't have a, have a, ready, uh, a ready set. Uh, but, you know, I think in, um, in very broad terms, uh, you know, to love your neighbor as yourself means you've got to compromise sometimes. You've got to listen to the other side. And I think this is where progressives, and certainly some progressive politicians, tend to go over the edge at the moment, uh, you know, in, in a kind of extremist rhetoric where it's our way or no way. And that's, I think, you know, uh, I think one of the things you get from the, the kind of symphony of different voices in the Old Testament is that you need to, compromise may not be quite the best word for it, but you need to work things out so that you can live with some diversity of opinion. May I add on that, Peter? And, uh, so you know, one of the things that surprised me reading the book was the section on abortion specifically, yeah. because yes. this is a litmus test, this is a lightning rod, and people say the Bible says, and what, what does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't say anything whatsoever about abortion. You know, in Jewish tradition, when they want to refer to a biblical text in that context, it's a text in Exodus. If uh, people are fighting and a, a woman is injured, a pregnant woman is injured and loses the baby, that isn't abortion. You know, but that's the closest they could find. That's, I mean, it's quite fascinating in itself. Uh, but you see, part of the, the problem with abortion is deciding when you have a human person. And this is something on which your, people's uh, opinions and attitudes have changed radically over time. Very often in Jewish tradition, it's when the crown of the head appears. Now, uh, we don't want to adopt that either. But, you know, there, there isn't any definitive pronouncement on the subject. We'll have to figure that one out. And I was surprised to read that thou shalt not kill is a little more nuanced than it sounds in English translation. <laughs> Absolutely, because then, you know, in, in many cases in the Bible, and if you do kill, we'll kill you. 
the, 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 this is a beautiful case of this in Genesis chapter 9. You know, God made, man is made in the image of God. So, uh, if somebody kills anyone who sheds the blood of a man, by a man his blood should be shed. Some people have just been reading a commentary on, uh, on Genesis. Some people argue that it's for the sake of man or because of man, his blood shall be shed. But who's going to shed it? I mean, it's, it's, still, it's still calling for the death penalty. But, and in fact, one of the things that strikes you reading the Old Testament is the frequency of the death penalty. You know, and some Jewish writers in antiquity even boasted of that. Zero tolerance. Yeah, certainly at odds with the position of the Roman Catholic Church today. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, someone asks, what are some ethical quandaries that biblical values can help us with today? And I'm just thinking in the last week, you know, we've had mass shootings, we've had racial injustice, police violence. What, what might the Bible say to those issues? Well, you know, I think what you go back to in all of those issues is some variant of the golden rule, you know, of do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. That's pretty central in both Testaments, actually. Now, how you work out the ramifications of that then, you know, becomes a problem in every case. But, I mean, it would be very difficult to reconcile that with mass killing. It would be very difficult to reconcile that with a society that facilitates mass killing by making the implements available. Now, the Bible isn't going to address that directly, but I think if one has any sense of the values that are emphasized in either testament, then, then uh, we ought to be doing things differently on that, I think. One person writes, you say there are contradictions in the Bible. Others say it's wrong to pick and choose teachings of the Bible um, because you have to accept it all. How do you reconcile those, <laughs> those two positions? I, says, I don't reconcile them. I say you can't avoid picking and choosing. You know, if you have two uh, contradictory statements, uh, now, you can perhaps reconcile it, if you like, in the way of, of Koheleth or Ecclesiastes. There is a time to love and a time to hate. And so if you have two contradictory positions, it's a matter of timing. It's a matter of judging which one is to apply. And there are certainly some cases where that holds true. You know, in the book of Proverbs, you have two verses, one after the other. Uh, first one says, do not answer a fool according to his folly. And the next one says, answer a fool according to his folly, or he'll think he is wise in his own eyes. Well, you can't do both. You know, it's got to be one or the other. You've got to pick and choose. And it may be a matter of choosing the right situation. And in some cases, it may be a matter of choosing one that you think was actually wrong to begin with. I mean, uh, one that was right to begin with as, a, as opposed to one that was wrong to begin with. But one person has a specific question about the translation of Micah 6.8, which is in the lectionary for today, and is oh, oh. A, a famous verse, yeah. do, do justly love yeah. mercy or kindness and walk humbly with your God. Um, and specifically, is this a one-way obligation, or is there something covenantal about it? Ooh, I'm not even sure I get the full ramifications of that. Uh, I mean, is the point, and they should love you too? Or, or guess, people should yeah. do justice to you too? Well, yeah, I guess so. But you know, you can't usually determine what other people are going to do. You're only responsible for what you do yourself. And so we hope it will be covenantal, even with regard to God. But we can't control that. You know, you can only do your own side of it. I don't know if that meets the question or not. But. <laughs> There's uh, some in the, in, among our virtual viewers, there's a lot of talk about revelation, and someone mentioned uh, it was a real mistake to include revelation in the canon. Any thoughts on that? Not at all, not at all. Uh, Adela wouldn't have had her dissertation topic. 
<laughs> but I think, yeah, I think Revelation is, is actually a wonderful book. It's a wonderfully vivid book. Uh, the mistake would be to take it as, uh, as somehow a guideline for, for, for how you should act or live. But it's a wonderful book of imagination. And you know that there are also situations, you know, as they say, it's often a question of timing. And uh, you know, there are, what, what really drives the book of Revelation is anger against Rome after the destruction of, uh, of, the, of Jerusalem uh, and you know, persecution of Christians as the author saw it. Uh, and you know, it's, it, that there are times that call for anger. There are times, I think, that call for even violence, perhaps. You know, in, in uh, uh, we, just yesterday we went to, to see Leopoldstadt and you know that that was a situation that the whole Nazi period was obviously a situation that called for a violent response. And I think we have those in life and we still have them. And Revelation has its time and its place. It's just not a doctrine for all seasons. All right, one final question um, from, that's been submitted. Um, biblical values and really the Bible as a whole can get distorted in translation, whether that's translation from Hebrew to Greek or Hebrew yeah. to English. Um, yeah. Can you talk about how that happens and specifically how the word justice might change in, as it uh, morphs into different languages? Well, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind there is the question of how it should be translated at all. You know, if, if it's dikaiosune in Greek, is that justice or righteousness? And, you know, very often in translations of the New Testament, it would be translated as righteousness. Now, if you say justice, that has a very different valence in English. You know, because you think of righteousness is, you know, self righteousness. It's a matter of how you look to God, so to speak. And it can be quite self centered. If you say justice, it's very much societal. It's a matter of how you treat other people. It's a whole different thing. So, you know, in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or for justice. It makes a huge difference, I think. And I think in all probability, it should be justice. Certainly, if you read the New Testament in light of the Old Testament, it should be justice. And what is a biblical definition of justice? Oh, I think a biblical definition of justice is that the strong should not oppress the weak. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it's basically a matter of caring for the weaker members of society. I think that's the, the fundamental of it. You know, it is not so much a matter of assuring that each, uh, that, that all the rich get everything they think they're entitled to, which is maybe a popular definition of justice at some times. Anything uh, final from you, Liza? Good. Uh, as we struggle with the Bible, wrestle with it, read it, what guidance do you give us as we approach it? Um, read it with an open mind. You know, try not to assume that you should respond to something in a particular way. So that, you know, if something strikes you as right or as wrong, you know, think about it. You may be right. You know, we shouldn't, because what kills the Bible, I think, is the accumulated weight of tradition. You know, the accumulated weight of assumptions that people bring to it. And as I say, this was true already in antiquity even. So that's... You have uh, warned people against making an idol yes. of the Bible yeah. and imposing upon it. Yeah. Um, so that's the weight you're talking about. Right. One, one uh, reform of Vatican II that I've always regretted is, you know, having the priest walk in holding up the book. I, that, that strikes me as wrong. 
you know, the book isn't to be looked at, it's not something to bow down before, it's something to listen to. Mm. All right. to hear. Well, yeah. We, yeah. we need to stop there. Yeah. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Collins. Thank you, Liza. <laughs> getting warmed up. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for being here. A lot to think about this morning. Um, we hope you'll join us for worship at 11 a.m., whether you're here in person or joining us online. And we hope you'll be back for the forum next week. We're going to be celebrating the uh, Lunar New Year, and we're going to have Ying Yen from the New York Chinese Cultural Center with us to explain traditions associated with it, with it before we uh, then experience the lion dance for ourselves later next Sunday. So join us then. <laughs>